how's it going? Okay, so if you're hearing this, you're probably like, what's going on? Why are you talking to me like this? Uh, well, so we, we, we went through a rebrand. We originally were, speaking of which, we're now Drunken Book Club. But I wanted to keep old episodes alive. So here are the episodes before the main update to Drunken Book Club. These are, you know, episodes that we did on a bunch of different books. Before we rebranded to Drunken Book Club, I keep referring to us as Drunken Book Club, but also reference, speaking of which, which is the old podcast. So, there we are. Also, our new socials for this are at dbc underscore pod for Twitter, and our Patreon is patreon.com slash drunken book club. Definitely recommend checking it out. It's only a dollar a month, and you can tell us what books to read. Alright, well, that's it. You guys enjoy the episode. Bye-bye. Have you ever thought to yourself, hey, these guys should talk about this book on Drunken Book Club? Or even, hey, I want to hear them gush about this on Rubles Rupees. Well, guess what? We'll listen to you if you pitch in a dollar on our Patreon. That's right, for one dollar, we'll listen to you. And along with that dollar, you know what else you get? You get access to all the bonus episodes that I put out every single week, including the backlogs, and early access to all our podcasts and videos, and everything else that I put up on there. So for a dollar, I think it's pretty much worth it. But you be the judge. Check it out. It's at patreon.com slash speaking of which. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Drunken Book Club. I'm your camp counselor, Christopher, the underage drinking Rupal, joined with... The final girl. Probably not, but let's just pretend that way. Sam. You know, before uh, before you got out of high school, you would have been a final girl. Yeah. But. You took it from me. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you took, yes, yes, I took your virginity. Well, in a way you did, but it was also, like. Yeah. I took the construct that is virginity away from Sam. <laughs> I don't know what that concept is now. It means nothing to me. <laughs> I took it away. I like, went. He just took it from my brain. Yes. And this time around, we, to, in celebration of the new Fear Street movies, uh, for the second movie, since it takes place in, in a camp, on Cat Nightwing, I don't know if it's going to be based around this book or not, we read Lights Out, Fear Street's Lights Out. The, I, I actually don't know which number of the Fear Street books this is. I mean, it's not like there's really a... Uh, there's not an order. There is an order. Oh, there is. Well, not to, like, in, to read, but, you know, upon release. Yeah. It's not like Goosebumps were on the spine it says which number it is. Because it doesn't matter if you read, like, another one first. Yeah. I mean, but, like, Goosebumps always had the numbers on the spines. True. Like a manga. Like a manga. <laughs> Let's go over what we pre-gamed on for our Drunken Book Club episode. I started off this afternoon by eating a ham sandwich. And on that ham sandwich, I put two moonshine pickles. Oh. Yes, that's that's why I brought it up. Almost like a Cubano, if you would. Except, I, I think, don't you need bacon to make it a Cubano? I don't remember. Do you want me to look it up right now? <clears throat> no. It's not that important. Cubanos are delicious. They are delicious. I love a Cubano. I just know it's ham pickles. I think it's bacon, too. I know you need mustard and cheese. I put mustard and cheese on there. Because. So. I put the... Dijon mustard. Nice. Yes. And I, a little bit later on, I had my 24 ounce... What what what's the what's the I oh the hard was heart it tea? twisted tea twisted tea a half lemonade half tea pretty all right and I also had a shot of s'mores three olive s'mores vodka and now I'm currently nursing a diet rum and coke so by the way for a cubano <laughs> yes ham roasted pork Swiss cheese pickles and mustard mm, I have is provolone a, is a true cubano mm, but yeah. pretty similar still yeah similar enough. So I pre-gamed on Dr. Pepper with a bit of vodka in it. Yeah. Half a shot of the s'mores vodka. Mm-hmm. And now I am nursing a campfire stout from High Water Brewing. And if you couldn't tell from our drinks going with this episode, we try to keep it with somewhat of a camby feel. Because I feel like pickles are kind of like a camp thing. S'mores are definitely a camp S'mores thing. definitely. Uh, the, unfortunately, my rum and coke is definitely not a camp drink. But has- twisted tea, I feel like a twisted tea is a nice, uh, you know, tea, lemonade. You know, that's that's a tea, that's like a camp drink. Well, they had soda at Camp Nightwing. They did. So. Soda pop. It's not to say that they wouldn't have put something in it. That is true. But I don't think they'd have rum and coke. All right. Uh, and that's all for, for pre-gaming. Anything before we start talking about the book, Sam? Um, no. 
Okay, so for my notes, I'm going to start things off by reading the first chapter in its entirety. Camp Nightwing, dear chief, here I am at Camp Nightwing, just as I promised. The other cancelers are here at here, and the lucky campers are arriving tomorrow. Everything looks cool so far. Don't worry about a thing, chief. I'll make them pay. Every one of them. Just as I promised you before, I'm through. Everyone will be calling it Camp Nightmare. I'm just trying to figure out where to start. Any ideas, Chief? Please write back and let me know what you think. I'm dying to hear from you. Yours forever, me. <laughs> and that's, that's the first chapter right there. Chapter 2. We meet Holly, who is unpacking for her stay as a new camp counselor at Camp Nightwing. She's working for her Uncle Bill, who teases her about living on, on Fear Street. And that'll probably be the last time we hear about Fear Street, right? Actually, I think we only hear about, like, one other time in this book. I don't remember. You don't. You read this yesterday! I just don't remember them mentioning Fear Street. They mentioned it, like, twice, I think. It's n- not really the big thing I was paying attention to, to be it's fair. Fear Street. <laughs> <laughs> they mention Fear Street all the time. We learn that Uncle Bill never has success with any of the businesses he opens. The first year it opened, there was a fire started by lightning that burned down the rec hall. The second year had a giant flood. And then an outbreak of fucking measles. <laughs> measles. What fucking year is this that measles is fucking breaking out? Douchebag anti-vaxxers. Uh, apparently. And last year, a camper died in a boating accident. So Uncle Bill looks like he could use the help. After a bunch he needs of... an accomplice. <laughs> right, he needs an accomplice. <laughs> After a bunch of exposition, we meet Holly's best friend, Thea, who is also working at the camp. Thea was shocked to hear that Uncle Bill uh, was Holly's real uncle, but Holly asks that she not tell anyone so she doesn't get treated differently. Thea then explains that there are plenty of boys to choose from. Ah, yeah, horny teen camp summer. Ooh. But Holly is too interested, or is not, isn't too interested uh, since she barely broke up with her last boyfriend, George. And then a terrified cry rang throughout the camp, saying, It's a chapter break! <laughs> chapter 3. The cry is from Uncle Bill. He's in the rec room and under a pile of sports equipment that came off of a loose side cabinet. They readjust the cabinet so it doesn't completely crush Uncle Bill. Unc- I'm going to be saying Uncle Bill a lot. Uncle Bill. Un- Uncle Bill. Can we call you Uncle Blackie? No. <laughs> Mr. Black <laughs> Uncle <laughs> Camp Krusty We love you Uncle Bill st- Uncle Bill tells them that it shouldn't have fallen at all Because all four corners are screwed into the wall But one got loose somehow Even though a week ago they were fine Da-da-da. Both girls stay and pick up the equipment While Uncle Bill gets the tools to fix the situation As they put away the gear They notice there's a red feather inside the hole That the cabinet would have been screwed into. We got ourselves a rogue parrot. No, Miss Parrot. No, Miss Parrot. Fear Street. I heard you're from Fear Street. The girls don't think too much about it and finish organizing the loose equipment. Thea babbles on about boys, but she says there's other competition for them because there's another girl named Jerry Marcus. Then Holly ends the chapter with this moment, and I'm going to read it on chapter 14. That I'm gonna, bitch. Actually, I'm going to have Sam read. Short red hair from Waynesbridge. Holly realized she's babbling, but couldn't help it. Right description, Thea said, but I don't know where she's from. You can ask her yourself. Here she comes now. No, Holly cried. Oh, no, not here. It can't be. Chapter 4. Holly is freaked out that it's the same Jerry Marcus she was friends with a long time ago, but had ended in tragedy. Jerry walks into the rec room like she owns the place and says hi to Thea, but ignores Holly and then leaves. Holly explains what happened two years back when they were friends. It ended when Jerry started dating an 18-year-old boy who had graduated already, and and in in quotes I put creep, and her parents didn't approve. So she asked Holly to lie about them hanging out together, and then this happened. And I'm going to read page 17... Which, by the way, don't, like, no. Don't. If you're if you're young, much younger than an 18-year-old, don't do it. Yeah, because she said, what, three years younger? So she would have been... Like, 13, 14, maybe? Thir- 14, I think. Yeah. So, bar- like, barely a freshman? Yeah. Like, uh-uh. No. Don't that, do that's, it. That's being taken advantage of by the senior right there. Don't do it. 
She was convinced she was madly in love with Brad, said Holly. She told me her life would be ruined if she didn't see him. Then she asked me to cover for her and say she was with me when she was with Brad. Nice, said Thea sarcastically. So what did you do? It turned into a mess. You know me. I'm not good at lying, but I promised her I wouldn't say anything about Brad to her parents. I just wasn't sure I could tell a direct lie. So Jerry said she understood, and basically everything was fine, until one night, about eleven o'clock, her mother called my house looking for her. What did you tell her? I was so rattled I just blurted out I hadn't seen Jerry. So her mother goes, but she's supposed to be studying with you. So like a dope, I said, oh, I forgot. She isn't here yet. At eleven o'clock at night? Right. Holly agreed gloomily. So now Mrs. Marcus is really upset and worried about Jerry, so I start telling her I'm sure Jerry's okay. And somehow she figured out Jerry was with Brad. Whoa, said Thea. So the next day Jerry called. Her voice sounded so cold I almost didn't recognize it. She said she was grounded for the rest of the semester and it was all my fault that I did it because I was jealous. I tried to explain what happened, but she wouldn't listen. She's hated me ever since. There was a silent moment. But it wasn't your fault, she said. You told her you couldn't tell a lie. She would never have asked you to do it. She should have never asked you to do it. But she did, said Holly, and maybe if I'd been a better friend, I would have found a way to keep her mother from getting suspicious. I doubt it, said Thea. Anyway, it's all in the past now. Thea says to ignore her. The other counselors had arrive, have, uh, start arriving, and Holly introduces us to some. First there's the weirdo, Kit, then Deborah, the cool older counselor, Mick, a Kevin Bacon-looking motherfucker... It's just Kevin Bacon. ...who is creeping on Holly... Holly and Thea go back to their respective cabins to finish unpacking. It's gotten late and the sun is going down when Holly notices a huge shape fluttering towards her from the shadows. It's a chapter break. Chapter no, it's just Kevin Bacon studying for a role. It's not It's not anyone else other than Kevin Bacon. I'm trying to think what Kevin Bacon was doing in 92. Tremors, I think. No, no, that was 1990. Uh, I can't think of what he would be doing then. They were trying to talk him into the Tremors sequels. Uh, Tremors 2, actually, was a lot later. Oh, okay. I think that was like 96. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Uh, it's a brown bat! She tries frantically to get it out with a canoe paddle, but is unsuccessful. It eventually swoops at her face, and Holly freaks out and runs out of the cabin, running into Jerry and two other female counselors. They poke fun at her and ask if she's going out canoeing. Holly explains the bat situation, and Brenda, disgusted with her, asks why she didn't chase it out. Deborah or? Uh, Deborah. I put Brenda, damn it. And Deborah, disgusted with her, asks why she didn't chase it out, and gets a broom and does just that. Jerry comments rudely that the woods are filled with bats. De I know, I put Deborah on the next part. <laughs> Deborah gets the bat out and tells the girls to hurry, or else they'll be late for the campfire. Holly and the rest of the girls head to the campfire. She sees Thea by herself and sits with her, but something seems off about Thea. Then Mick sits w between them and tries chatting up with Holly, asking about the Friday the 13th movies, talking about how in the first movie there's a scene with Jason with a hatchet. Mm, actually, he didn't appear until the second movie. Because mm. wasn't that his mom? It was his mom in the first movie. Even I know that, and I've never watched the first one. I thought I'd watch it with you. Nope. No? No. Which ones have you seen with me? I don't know what I've I don't think I've seen any of them all the way through with you. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to have to change that. Yeah, I was going to say, are we going to change that this summer? Uh, eh, sooner or, or later. At some point. Some point in time. I think we saw Sleepaway Camp. We did watch Sleepaway Camp. I love Sleepaway and Camp. And I know we saw Friday the... Or not Friday the... Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Yep. Because I had to show you that one. very gay. Yeah. And I actually referred to the Scream Queen thing to my boss. Yeah? Because he likes horror. Yeah, cool. I think you two would get along. Yeah, okay. And I, I honestly can't think of a scene where Jason's ever used a hatchet for what it's worth. Like, I've he's used a fire axe. Or not fire, but like a woodcutter axe. But he's never used like a hatchet. Isn't machete more his he, like, I signature? Mean, he uses, I mean, that's like his signature, but he uses a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Like, like he's, a sleeping bag to just throw him around. <laughs> well, that only happened in like number six and then later on in X. Like, they, they made a reference to it and actually did an improved version of it in X. That one just cracks me up because it's so dumb, but it's great. Uh, but let me continue. Uh, he eventually leaves and Uncle Bill shows up with a cooler full of sodas. Uncle, Expl Uncle, Spill. Uncle Bill explains the rules of the camp, but Holly is distracted by some rustling in the bushes. Uncle Bill then asks everyone to introduce themselves, but before it goes on for too long, a hockey mask wearing man with a hatchet appears from the bushes and is advancing on Holly with a chapter break. What is this, Friday the 13th Part 2? Am I right, people who have seen this one? Yeah, ooh, yeah, Chris, <laughs> yeah, I get it. 
Because in the second one, there's a scene where they're actually telling the legend of uh, Jason, and some guy jumps out of the bushes, not in a hockey mask, but in in like this really bad outfit, basically uh, being like, "Ooh, I'm Jason." Pretty much going ooga booga, and yeah. And then they're like, oh, "Stop it, you!" Yeah, which I'm like, they l- literally did pull this scene from fucking Friday the Thirteenth, pretty much minus this camp, the uh, a horror story going on. Yeah. Chapter six. Uncle Bill calls out Kit and his little prank and tells him to sit his ass down because it's Kit who did it. Thea explains that Kit almost got fired last year for a prank he did on some campers. Holly thinks Uncle Bill must be desperate to rehire Kit. Kit sits next to Jerry and Thea explains some more that he's wild for her, but Jerry couldn't give a damn about the nerd, nerdy little simp. Oh yeah, so I put with, when they said, oh, Kit's a little weird, I'm like, little weird, that's either a huge red flag or he's really not pretty much harmless other than just kind of being a jackass. There is no middle ground. You sure? Well, there I learned there is, but that's that was my impression when I first read this. Okay. Before I got to later. Okay. How about that? The the introductions continue with the camp counselors and we meet Sandy Wayne, a rich looking tennis instructor for the camp, and John, the guy Thea was fucking last summer, but who doesn't even seem to notice her now. He got his hand jobs. The <laughs> introductions are then wrapped up and Uncle Bill explains a few more rules, like campers lights out is nine and counselors is ten thirty. And also, no dating the campers. Like, why is this a, a rule? Aren't they kids? Like, like legit, like, I had that question. So, my thought is very simply power dynamic. Yeah. Of, it can be used since they're older teens versus, like, younger teens. Mm-hmm. It can be basically used as kind of a grooming where the camp, where certain campers might get special benefits in exchange for yeah. certain behaviors, which would not be good on multiple levels. Because when I worked as a camp counselor, as, as a summer camp, like as a day camp mm-hmm. counselor, we were in the age group of like 14 to 18, I think, was the, the oldest of any of us, like for the intern stuff. Mm-hmm. And like the oldest they allowed for kids was 13. So, so that might be okay, but I don't know how young they go. Because right. it sounds like the ones that they watch. Yeah, that Holly has are like little kids. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, there's I mean, there are, uh, camps tend to have like age range from like I feel like it's probably like seven to like thirteen or yeah. fourteen or whatever. So I feel like it's just to instead of make it one of those like more complicated of like if they're thirteen, it's okay. I suppose, I've never been to a sleepaway camp. I feel like it's different than a summer camp. Yeah, I think that's like also the thing camp. of the fact that you have them all like sleeping under the same area. Yeah. Uncle Bill ends the meeting, and Holly wants to go to bed and asks Thea to walk back with her to the cabin, but Thea uh, wants to say hi to John first. Holly notices John seems kind of emotionless, but is distracted from her judgments when Mick pops up to hit on her some more. This goes nowhere, and the chapter ends with Holly noticing Jerry standing under a tree, staring menacing at her. Uh, where's the book? I need it. Because I need to read page, uh, chapter 7. She's just standing there. Menacingly! I, I, I use that comment too often of, like, they stand there menacingly. I do that a lot. I mean, that's what that's what she was, though. She was just being a bitch. Yeah, but I'm like, do chief. Things are off to a good start. I started my work already, just as I promised you. It wasn't easy taking the bolts out of the wall, but it worked like a dream. Or a nightmare. It's just too bad that the whole cabinet didn't come down, but I have plenty of time. After all, lots of accidents can happen in a summer camp. Lots of deadly accidents. Please and write. There, there. Please write and let me know how you're doing. Remember. Chief, I'm always here for you. Yours forever, me! So I, when I saw that chapter, I was like, Oh no, no, you mean it wasn't an accident? <laughs> Whoa. I mean, it was pretty obvious. Yeah, that's what I mean of like... Chapter 8. As I was like, most of these Fear Street books kind of... like I'll get into it at the end of like how I feel about Fear Streets and how I felt about this one. But a lot of them really have this kind of stereotypical kind of like um, setup. Kind of like, like, not exactly like this one where you see, like, these kinds of letters, but you sometimes do get chapters in the perspective of, like, the the evil. It seems like it is very much kind of like Goosebumps, though, in the sense of, like, there's a lot of similar beats. Oh, definitely. I mean, Arl Stein's literally beat for beat doing the same same shit. It's just, you know, it, there just happens to be sexier stuff. Yeah. And he uses the word sexy. And Kevin Bacon. But not in this book. He doesn't use the word sexy in this book. I would have taken note, because I usually do that whenever I read a Fear Street book. Chapter 8! Holly awoke before six to the sound of birds singing and the scent of fresh pine needles. She quietly got ready, stepping into her new bathing suit and grabbing a towel. 
As she exits the cabin, she knows there's a morning fog and that the ground is slightly moistened with dew. She's headed out for a swim, but hears a loud thumping behind her. It's Sandy, who is out for a morning jog. He warns her of the leeches and how the water gets deep fast. And, uh, and hose on with... <laughs> Hose on. He's just yeah, a hose. As I'd say, See, I'm imagining him goes wearing, on with his jog. Sorry, I'm imagining him wearing like the '70s like short jogger shorts, like the really I feel like, short. Like I mean, that's like a camp movie staple. And him just like walking away, but like doing a little more sway in his hips yeah. to make his booty. Yeah, kick I, a little bit more. I was about to say because like I remember what I mean. A lot of the summer camp movies I've seen, like horror and comedy. There's those like tight little like summer summer shorts. That's what, yeah. I, that's what I call like. Them, that's what I was shorts. thinking with those shorts. Yeah. Like, as Holly continues, she is stopped again, but by Mick who is headed to the boats to get them ready. He asks Holly for help, and she obliges. We learn the name of the lake is Feather Lake. <laughs> I don't know why I put that detail in it, there. It's a bo- it's such a lame name, it seems right. like it's... We don't even hear that name e- ever again, really. And in some ways, it's great world building, because at least they're not like, remember Feather Lake? Right. Well, you know, the, the Fear Street books are pretty good about establishing, like, Shady Side High and all the different areas around it. Yeah. And they do get reused a lot in them. It's just this one... You know, taking place in the summer camp. You do hear about the mall and yeah. the and Shady Side High in this book, but we'll get back to that later. They reach the boats and find only one canoe instead of four. They're in the water and have had holes punched through them. To Holly's shock, there's a red feather inside one of the holes. That parrot is at it again. It takes most of the morning to get the rest of the canoes out of the water, and Holly misses breakfast and runs late to the counselor camper meet and greet. Deborah scolds her like the bitch she is. Holly is assigned six campers, and she leads them to their cabin. They choose their beds, and Holly helps the smallest with her luggage when suddenly she hears creaks. And then a loud bang! It's a chapter break. Chapter 9. One of the bunk beds has collapsed under one of the campers' weights. No one is hurt, but all the girl campers are freaking the fuck out. I mean, that's fair. Like Yeah, that, that, that's fair. Holly tries to comfort them, but fails, and Deborah barges in, screaming at Holly and blaming her for the crying. Holly tries to explain, but she doesn't listen. Uncle Bill comes in to inspect what's going on and says he'll get their handyman to fix it and check on all the beds. Holly comfort, comfort, comforts, oh my god, I can't say comfort, one of the girls and inspects the broken bed and finds another red feather. You know what I realized, by the way? Huh? I realized, like, Deborah hit really big of a chord with me. Yeah. She was like my old boss. <laughs> she was. I'm like, I think I'm legit triggered. Like, <laughs> you're Holly. I was gonna say, I you're think getting that... macked on. Hey, it... baby, come get sexy. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. Hey, come get sexy, lady. I'm not Let sure. Let me scratch the back of your head like you like, lady. Yeah. Oh, she likes it. Now make out with me. I'm not sure if I'm ready for <laughs> that. <laughs> Are you gonna be a dick to me now? Yes. Oh, uh, you gave me boner, but now you know touchy. Ugh. Holly drops her campers at some activities so she can talk with Uncle Bill. But he's too busy to talk and ask her to leave. On her way out, she sees Deborah by herself. And this interaction happens. Uh, do you want to read this one, Sam? Sure. Okay. I think I remember this because this one made me the most mad. And I was like, oh my god. Hi, said Deborah. There's no smile of welcome. Just weariness in her dark eyes. She tossed her head impatiently. And the little jade owl on the thong around her neck bounced against her peach-colored t-shirt. Holly took a deep breath. I just want to say I'm sorry for what happened this morning. I don't know how things got so out of hand, but I promise I'll try harder from now on. Let's hope so, said Deborah. But I also want to ask you something. Something that will make it easier for me to do my job. She paused for a moment. When Deborah didn't answer, she went on as calmly as she could. I, I felt really bad when you scolded me in front of the girls and the other counselors, she said. I'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't do that again. If I do something you don't like, please just tell me in private. For a moment, Deborah just stared blankly at her. The expression in her eyes unreadable. Then the expression came clear. It was anger. In other words, said Deborah, you want me to ignore emergencies so I won't hurt your feelings? That's not what I said, protested Holly. I had no choice but to speak to you this morning, Deborah went on, her voice rising. I left you alone for five minutes, and we nearly had a hurt child on our hands. If I hadn't intervened, you'd probably still be standing there like a statue. But I... Forget it, Holly, Deborah shouted over over her protest. The most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is the campers. Don't think you'll get special treatment just because you're Uncle Bill's niece. dun na Holly wonders how, who told her, and probably everyone else, about her relation to Uncle Bill. 
she sees Jerry smiling like the bitch she is and thinks she exposed her secret. Holly goes to lunch and Thea t wants to talk with her about after the campers have gone to bed by the lake. Holly then eats her lunch with her campers when Kit appears from the doorway, screaming for help. A green snake has wrapped around its wrapped itself around his arm. He runs around the mess hall, freaking everyone out, and then yanks the snake off and tosses it at Holly's table. Chapter 10. Seriously, how has he not been fired? Holly freezes at the sight of the snake and tries to do something, but can't. Thea appears and tosses the snake at the wall like a bamf. A roar of laughter comes from the mess hall. It's a rubber snake. Deborah demeans Holly some more on chapter break. It's, next, it's nighttime and Holly sneaks out of the cabin to meet Thea. They meet partway there and Thea says that Jerry and Deborah are close friends and that might explain why she's been a bitch. Holly tells Thea that the red feather about the red feathers, but Thea's a bit distracted because she's expecting John. Holly is tired and heads back, uh, but Thea wants to wait for John. On her way back, Holly hears footsteps behind her. Then she stops to listen. They stop as well. Then they rush towards her. It's a chapter break. And chapter 11, I actually have written on a piece of paper. I never typed this part up. <laughs> I read this one at, in bo during box office at work. Okay. It's two campers out past Lights Out, for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh, gotta love the, the consistency and the fake out. Right. There are so many fucking fake outs. It got pretty tiring after a while. Yeah, at that point I just kind of grew numb to it. Yeah. Holly helps them back to their cabin when she sees a light. It's Mick. He says in a sultry voice that he was looking for her to say thanks for helping him with the uh, canoes and starts hitting on her. Holly thinks he's coming on too strong and rejects his advances. He gets butthurt over it and tries to force her to go on a walk with him by grabbing her, but he, but he stops his rape fantasy and gives up. Note, she says she was flattered about the crush, but this guy is gross. Thanks, Chris, for putting that note in there. Because uh, <laughs> literally, she's like, I kind of like him. And then he's like super creepy. And she's like, he's still kind of cute, though. Holly heads back to her cabin. When she gets there, she thinks she sees uh, someone coming out. Then a hand comes down on her shoulder. It's Sandy. He's out for a stroll. Holly asks if he, if he saw uh, if someone exited the cabin. He says no, and they have a... Nice, supportive chat. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was. It was a very yeah. supportive chat. I'm gonna say, like, he just seems like he's like, oh, you doing all right? Yeah. It seems kind of rough for you right now. Holly slips back to her bed and relaxes, but not before she feels something slithering in her pillow. It's a snake and a chapter break. Yeah, I can toss that out now. Uh, did I make it in? I don't think I did. No, you didn't. I did? Oh, no, nice. you did not. I did, sweet. Ooh, Michael Jordan. This time it's a real snake. <laughs> Holly screams and awakens everyone in her cabin. The girls are freaked out and Deborah demeans Holly again and gets rid of the snake and claims it's a garter snake. Little pussy. Uh, Holly thinks someone planted it there and she's going to try to talk to Uncle Bill about it in the morning. The next day, Holly tries talking with Uncle Bill about the feathers and, and accents, but he scoffs it off as coincidence because... You can find feathers everywhere at Camp Nightwing. You know how you just see red feathers everywhere in the forest? Yeah. In, in, in the middle of the U.S., just red feathers? Yeah. And I'm thinking it's probably like craft store red feathers where they're yeah, like... Yeah, they look like that. Ungodly red. Also, I put at the end of this pointless fucking chapter. <laughs> can I get the book again? I need to read page... I need to read chapter 13. It's another fun chapter with a creepy voice. Hey, Chief. No, Camp Nightwing. Dear Chief... I haven't heard from you in a long time now. A lot of things have been happening. Bad things. But they're also good, if you know what I mean. I've been doing everything I promised, and more. Now I'm ready to take the next step. The big step. Someone in this camp is going to die. I promised, and I'm going to deliver very soon. It'll be the person who most deserves it. Too bad. She's kind of cute. I'll write and tell you about it. Please write back, Chief. I've been waiting so long for a letter. Yours forever, me. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead now. So I have like two theories on that. On not this chapter, but kind of like as I was developing. Mm -hmm. Part of me was going, is Jerry going to die? 
Yeah, yeah. Because I was hoping Jerry was going to die because she's a bitch. <laughs> you were so hopeful. And we're getting into spoilers. Can't we at least get to our first death before we get into spoilers? Okay. Chapter 14. Holly decides to take action and find out on her own who's been fucking with Camp Nightwing. <laughs> she thinks it's one of the counselors, and she plans on finding out as much as she can about them during a softball game with another camp. She doesn't find anything out. She mostly just stares at them and finding that none of them seem suspicious. You know what's got to be weird during that game? Huh? Like, you're just a counselor and you're just doing the job, and then she's just, like, staring. Just, just... Mm. Mm. After the game, she takes her campers to General Swim and Mix and Mick and Mick hits on her and invites her to the lake that night. She reluctantly agrees. Holly meets up with Mick and we find out this is his third year here working at the camp, and he lives on a farm. He gets horny for her, but she just wants to be friends, and he goes into another white male rapist frenzy and tries pulling her in for a kiss. That's the term I thought you'd get kicked out of. I mean, that's basically what it is. So. Yes. She doesn't know if she wants this or not and pushes him away and he lands in the lake. She tries to help him, but he refuses and tells her off. Holly walks away and Jerry is there and she's pissed. Jerry thinks that Holly is trying to steal Mick away from her and that Holly won't get away with it. Chapter 15. It's the next day and Holly is tired because she didn't get much sleep. As she's walking, she's nearly hit by a softball and Sandy asks if she's okay. Holly at first is unsure if she should tell Sandy about what's going on, but she gives in and tells him of the three accidents and the feathers. Sandy doesn't believe her, but says that she's too close with all this and needs to just relax, and that she'll get her chance this upcoming week with the wilderness trip. She didn't realize she was helping on that, but Sandy says she'll be fine. Holly heads off once again and is headed to the craft's cabin when she sees Thea and John in an argument. John storms off and Holly consoles Thea. Thea comments on Holly's honus with going to the lake with Mick and always talking with Sandy. Holly says they're just friends and Thea wants some of that Sandy ass. Holly... He hoed away, remember? Yeah. Holly... <laughs> he did hose away. Uh, Holly finally makes it to the crafts cabin. Holly helps with teaching the girls about making pottery and shows off one of Deborah's pots. But one of the girls pushes her way to see the pot and clumsy as Holly drops it. Deborah be pissed. The rest of the afternoon, Holly mechanically worked without any emotion. On her way back to her cabin, a giant spider dropped in front of her face. Uh, it's a rubber spider, and it was from Kit. And uh, let's let's read what happens on that page. Suddenly, something inside of her snapped. Why don't you grow up? She shouted at Kit. I've never done a single thing to you. What about Jerry? He said with a nasty smile. I hear you've done plenty to her. That's between me and Jerry, said Holly. And besides... I've got news for you, Kit cut in. You're looking for real trouble, not jokes. Then his face changed from sneering to menacing. Holly took a step back, and, Sk and Kip stepped toward her. Leave me alone, she cried as forcefully as she could. She ducked into the woods and began to run, finally stopping beneath a small clearing. And suddenly she felt her arms being pinned from behind. Kit, you creep, she said, struggling as hard as she could. Now is that a new way to talk, said a different voice. Mick's voice. It was Mick holding her. Let me go! What are you doing? Inviting, inviting you to join our little party, said Mick, his voice calm and cold. She didn't like my invitation, Kit said, appearing in front of her, holding the fake spider. Too bad. Maybe she'll like the party favors better. And now Jerry stepped into the clearing. Her mouth was fixed at a mocking grin, and she was carrying a bucket in both hands. Holding the bucket straight out in front of her, she began to walk slowly towards Holly. I know you're afraid of the outdoors, Holly, said Jerry, still grinning lastly. So here's your big chance to have all your nightmares come true. Holly continued to struggle against Mick, but it was no use. How can this be happening, she wondered. Please, she said, please let me go. As soon as you've learned your lesson, said Mick. As soon as you learn you're not better than everyone else. Jerry pushed the bucket against Holly's chest. Inside of it, squirming in the shallow, murky water were half a dozen slimy leeches. <laughs> this, is actually getting, this is actually one of the few times that... Uh... Fear Street kind of gets into some, like, real horror. Yeah, like, like, like kind of real... Like, I feel like Fear Street does its best to actually stick with reality stuff. Like, it doesn't go into the supernatural, like, at all throughout the series. Yeah. It's not like Goosebumps where it's like, it's an alien. It's it's a monster. No, you're actually a monster. My mummy's a werewolf, too. This again. Chapter 16. Holly is freaking out, and Jerry tells her that she doesn't appreciate her attitude. Jerry tells Mick to throw her in the creek... And Jerry proceeds to dump the rest of the leeches on her. 
Holly thinks she sees Sandy behind them, smiling, and with them, uh, smiling with them. But she looks again, and he's not there. Mick says that's enough, and forces Jerry to leave. While Kit follows like the cuckold puppy he is. <laughs> Holly decides not to snitch on them because they'll make matters worse. Personally, I think the opposite, but whatevs. Well, I think part of the problem is with how Bill's been acting, how Uncle Bill's been acting with, yeah. towards her. It's one of those they're not going to believe her. He's not going to believe her anyway. I think he'd believe her, but he can't do anything because he's so short shaft. Yeah. Short staffed. No, he's got a short staff. Yeah. He's got big pee. He's got small pee energy. No, nah, Uncle Bill's got big dick. Like, Uncle Bill's got big dick. That's why he's unsuccessful. Because of his dick? Yep. And that they were only trying to scare her, which they succeeded in. She's also convinced one of them is responsible for the other accidents. But she can think, but she can't think about it. Or, oh my god, why am I? But before she can think about it for hours, she hears a terrified shriek that says, No, please, no! Not another chapter break! <gasps> chapter 17. She sees a flash of clothes pass by. Then suddenly John appears, holding something that he quickly hides behind his back. To dildo. A dildles. She asks him what he's doing, but he avoids the question and says to leave him alone. He's just trying to masturbate else. in the woods, damn it. Yeah. So she does and decides to run back, so Deborah doesn't yell at her for being late. But she hears footsteps behind her and suddenly arms are around her, and it's Sandy. He asks her why she's covered in mud and soaked. She lies and says she fell in the creek, checking his face for guilt and helping Jerry. Uh, but she che- And she's checking his face for guilt uh, and seeing if he helped with Jerry. But there isn't any guilt. He might not feel guilty about it, though, if he helped. I don't think he helped. No, I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying more thinking process-wise. Not necessarily that he helped. Yeah. She lets out some of her frustration to him, and he listens to her. He then gives her the list of who's going to the wilderness trip, and they go their separate ways. She goes back to her cabin and then checks the list, and her heart sinks when she finds out Mick, Jerry, and Kit will be going along with her. Chapter 18. Suddenly, Thea is at her cabin door, calling for her. Holly lets her in and tells her about that what happened with the assholes three, and then her frustrations with Deborah. She comments that it's weird that Deborah isn't here as she likes to be there to make sure the campers wash before dinner. But Thea says she'll help Holly out, and they gather the kids and get them to dinner. Deborah isn't at the mess hall, and neither is John. Holly thinks they're in trouble, but Thea thinks they're finishing up some paperwork or some shit. Yeah, paperwork. Uh, Holly no, goes out no, to... No, no, no. Yeah, this is... The campers be fucking. Holly goes out to find Deborah. She checks the cabin, and she's not there. And then the craft cabin. The craft cabin was dark, and Holly was going to to not look in. But she decides to anyway. And this is what she finds. Read page 100, Sam. All of it. Deborah? She called, Deborah, are you in here? The only answer is a strange, high-pitched humming noise. Holly stepped all the way into the cabin, flipping the lights as she did. She stopped in shock. Everything in the room, the floor, the walls, was covered with bright red splatters. Splatters of blood. Blood that was flying from the spinning electric potter's wheel. Holly continued to look horrified and sickened. The wheel turned rapidly on each pass, rubbing away more and more of the things slept over it. The thing that she saw had once been a human face, but was now a bloody, massive pulp. It's fucking Deborah, and we get our first kill count. Our, yeah. Actually, our only body count. Yeah. Well, te- I mean, unless you count the, the dead kid in the fur. I feel like it's one of those kind of off-screen kind of deaths. Yeah. Like, it's not... It's one of those if we were doing, like, kill count with dead meat. Yeah. It wouldn't count. Yeah. Unless they did... I don't know. The owl pendant that Deborah wore got caught in the spinner and choked her. Also, best quote for the book. Everywhere she looked, Holly saw spilled paints, beads, feathers, leather thongs, and gimp. <laughs> that, that just made me laugh. Holly at first thought it was an accident, but now she's unsure and thinks it may be murder. Bum, bum, bum. John enters the room, seeing that the door was opened, and Holly goes to him and cries in his arms and says what happened. He goes to get Uncle Bill, and Holly stays with the body. She sits on the stool, looking at the door, but turns to look at Deborah once more and sees that something was intertwined with the pendant. It's a red feather. <gasps> I need the book. Because it's time to read chapter 20. So I was looking for a gimp. What does that even mean with gimp? I don't know. I don't do arts and crafts like that. I'm going to look it up for you. Can you not remember that on the page? I it's... forgot about gimp. Yeah. yeah. It's right there. It's uh, feather, leather thongs, and gimp. Yeah, I saw a gimp. I, I found gimp. All right. Chapter 20. Kim Nightwing. Dear Chief, guess what? I decided to take up pottery. I found it worthwhile. Quite worthwhile. 
I guess even the crafts counselor didn't know that making pots could be so dangerous. That pendant looks so nice around her neck, but not as good as my two hands. The local police came by for a while. They questioned everyone, but they asked Sherrod was an accident. A tragic accident. They didn't even notice my calling card, and I left it right where they couldn't miss it. That's all for now. What do you think, Chief? Should I kill the other one? It's up to you. Please write soon and let me know what you want me to do. Yours forever, me. So, Gimp, in yep. the way of arts and crafts at least. <laughs> yes, I would hope. An ornamental flat braid or round cord used as a trimming. Eh, okay then. That's a Gimp. That makes sense. I was going to say, the first thing I found was uh, how to use it as a slur. Uh, chapter 21. The police come that night and question everyone. And the next morning, forensic scientists came... To investigate as well. They suspect no foul play, but Holly knows it wasn't. Jerry also believes it was murder, but she suspects Holly did did it. But Holly tells the bitch off. Holly goes to Uncle Bill's office where a detective is there to speak with Holly. Holly explains the weird events, but like everyone else, he doesn't believe her. As an adult, and like in an R.L. Stein book, of course. Yeah. The detective leaves and Holly talks with Uncle Bill. He's reassigned Jerry to her bunk and Holly is pissed. She tells him that she hates her, but he doesn't listen and says to stop wasting his time. Chapter 22. The next night is the camp cookout, uh, and they're having a scary story contest around the fire. Holly decides this is the best time to investigate Mick, 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 Kit, and John's cabins for clues. I'm just going to say this. Yes. Kit's story is just him showing everyone his dick. Yeah. He's just going to be like, look at the scariest thing, and it's just this tiny flaccid dick. <laughs> it's, it's like a macro pee pee. <laughs> It, and it's got, like, red curly hairs all around it, so you can barely see it. There's too much foreskin. <laughs> There's too much foreskin and pubes. Yes. As she, it looks like a redwood forest. <laughs> uh, as she sneaks away, Thea asks her where she's going. Holly lies and sneaks away. She heads to cabin nine and checks Kit's possessions first. Also, I realize she did lie to Thea, but she said, apparently she's not a good liar, but apparently she was convincing enough here. Yeah, she can lie apparently sometimes. Yeah. She finds nothing out of the ordinary in Kit's possessions. She then checks John's possessions and at first doesn't find anything, but soon finds a little locked box. She searches for the key and finds it, but when she does, someone is at the door and opens it before she can hide. It's John and a chapter break. <laughs> chapter 23. There are 32 fucking chapters in this goddamn book. <laughs> to be fair, some of them are like one page. Yes. And that's why I've been reading them. John turns on the light and is shocked to find Holly. He demands to know what she's doing, and she lies at first, but he calls her bullshit. Calls her on her bullshit. Not calls her bullshit. So she tells him the truth. She gives back his box and tries to leave, but he won't let her. He asks that she stops spying on him and to not let anyone know about this, or she'll be sorry. She leaves and ponders on the situation when she comes upon Mick's cabin. She sees a warm yellow light coming from within, and that Mick is writing at the table. She also spies a set of Native American rattles held together with twisted yarn and on the handle of every rattle was a band of decoration made from red feathers. <gasps> da, 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 da. I wish we were here so we could do that. <laughs> uh, um, what was the thing I was going to say of like a... I don't know. Read your notes, bitch. Oh, with the whole like don't tell anyone about this? Yeah. What the fuck is she going to say? I found a box. I mean, it's kind of suspicious. Yeah. I mean, she could be like, hey, I found a box. And, like, Kit could be like, I'm going to sneak in there and check off in the box. <laughs> he would. Chapter 24 is another reading one. He just put some just actual spiders in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Camp Nightwing. Dear Chief, one of the counselors is getting suspicious. Too bad. I can't have that. I can't have anyone interfering with the things I have to do. Too bad she didn't mind her own business. But it's too late now. She'll be next, Chief. But I'll wait for the canoe trip. I'll let you know how it goes. Yours forever, me. Oh, yeah, so something like I remember on my notes yes. that I forgot to bring up because we're past the page now. Yes, go ahead. Then. But when um, Holly and Sandy are having like that one of the heart-to-hearts they have, uh -huh. Sandy says he was he was a camp counselor at a camp in the desert. Yeah. And I'm like, did he have to go through like the holes prison camp? <laughs> Yeah, he was just, he, yeah, he's fucking, what's his face, uh, 
The guy from from all those... I always forget his name, and he's like a really talented actor. Yeah. Not John Voight, but the other one. I know the one that played a... He was in... He was a Buster Scruggs. He was in the Watchmen oh, series. Oh, I know who you're talking about. I always forget his name, and he's like one of my favorite actors, and I feel so bad about it. He's great. Like... No, he's fantastic. He's one of my favorite actors for a reason. Like, yeah, it's just him. Yeah, it's, it's just him. He's just like, now I tell you once, I'm not gonna tell you again. And then Zero Trust. He was, you know what? He was in a camp movie. He was in Heavyweights. He was the guy trying to sell the camp to the to them at the beginning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> camp movie. I, I tied it together. He's also in Holes, which is a camp. Yeah, that, that's true. That is true. So. He was in Holes. I mean, I mean, we already brought that up. I know. But I was just thinking about that. I'm like, He's that? in more than one camp movie, though. Yeah. But I was just thinking a desert camp sounds fucking awful as someone who uh, lives. Sleepaway camp, yeah. Who lives in the desert during the summer. They have it, though. I mean, I've heard of them. They're not comfortable. I was gonna say, that sounds like a punishment, like... Chapter 25. The next morning, Uncle Bill calls all the counselors for a meeting. He tells them that this camp is hanging on by a thinning thread, and if one more bad thing happens, it's going under. And Jerry just pushes something off the fucking table to be a cunt. Why, is she a cat? Yeah, she, she's just a bitch. <laughs> so he asks that fucking they fuck Jerry. do their best not to fuck things up as he stares in Holly's direction. The meeting ends, and Holly, gra- Holly grabs two cups of coffee on on her way out for her and the other for Uncle Bill. She takes it to his office, and they discuss what he said, and she tries convincing him once more, but he won't give her the time, and this chapter feels too fucking long. Word count padding. There's a lot of word count padding in this one, but I I still enjoy it, but we'll oh, yeah. get there. One thing I've got to say with yes. this, I just find it weird because he calls her princess. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a little weird, Bill. I don't know. If he's close with her. Yeah. I, I feel like if you have an uncle who's close, it's okay to call your 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 niece princess. And it's also one of those, like, she's old enough that it's, like, a little... I mean, you, sometimes, you me. don't, sometimes you don't grow out of it. Yeah. I wonder if he wrote this around the same time as Stay Out of the Basement. That's what I was thinking right, right? now, too. I was like, wait uh, a minute. You can, you can check the beginning if you want while I read this. Chapter 26. It's the morning of the big wilderness trip, and Holly is informed that John will be joining them. Holly is scared and uh, is scared that he's going to do something. And then she is also informed that on the canoe portion of the trip, her partner will be Mick. And she's worried about that as well because of the feather decoration she saw the other night. Uh, 1992 is when Stay Out of the Basement came out. You're 91. looking at goof lumps. Oh, I noticed. <laughs> You're looking at Stay Out of the Bathroom, huh? I just saw that. I'm drunk. Stay okay. Out of the Basement's over here. It's 91. 90, oh, okay, so it's a little bit... He could have been writing it at the same time, though. Yeah, well, and it could have also been, like, a thought that he just kind of brought back of, like... Hm. Yeah, just just parallels. Yeah. Because so, I, I, there is another parallel to Goosebumps in this book, which I'll get to at the end of, with my notes. It's just Slappy, like... <laughs> yes, yes, it is, actually. Slappy appears with his cock out. <laughs> his nice hard wood. Uh, I lost my fucking point. Uh, okay. <laughs> the nature trip is crappy for Holly... None of the other counselors interact with her. When they reach the campsite, they prepare for the night. When digging a fire pit, Holly hears sobbing coming from the woods. She ventures out to find out who's in trouble, but ends up in trouble instead as she encounters John with a knife in the woods. <laughs> Chapter 27. John is angry at her for spying on him again, but Holly says she wasn't spying, but that but that she heard someone crying. Then Courtney, one of the senior campers, comes out of the woods and said she was crying. They explain their forbidden love between a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old, and that Holly has to keep their secret. Holly says she will, but won't lie for them. Huh, doesn't that sound familiar? Chapter 28. And that also doesn't come back anymore. Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, And that's something that never gets brought up again. Because we're literally four chapters away from finishing. Yeah. It's the next morning when Sandy awakens Holly to see if she'd like to come with him to scout the river ahead uh, with him, and she agrees. They canoe out a bit and appreciate nature. Then they get to the fork in the river he mentioned earlier and takes her down the path with the rapids. It's not as bad as Holly thinks they will, it will be. Then Holly starts catching Sandy on lies about camping here last summer when he said he had been at a desert summer camp. Then he, lies, then he tries to lie again and says he meant his brother had camped out here, but Sandy had told her he was an only child. And if you don't mind, uh, we should read the last page on, uh, on page 138. Sam, will you take the honors of this one? Sure. He sounded angry. Again, Holly was perplexed. Please, she said at last, at last, please tell me what's bothering you. He sighed loudly, then spoke in a strange new voice. I guess my problem is that I've been a little careless, he said. What do you mean? But you've been careless too, Holly. 
he said instead of answering her directly. What do you mean? He didn't answer, and suddenly, although she couldn't say why, she felt frightened. Frightened of Sandy. What do you mean? She repeated, I mean that you didn't tell anyone you were coming with me. Da -na -na! Chapter 29. Sandy reveals that the camper who had died last year had died because Deborah was careless on the wilderness trip, and that camper's name was Seth. Seth was his little brother, but Seth never liked that name, so Sandy called him Chief, and that his calling card is a red feather. <gasps> Chapter 30. He talks more crazy about revenge and not wanting to originally hurt Holly, but because she's a nosy bitch, the bitch has to go. They're rushed, they, they're rushed into the white water rapids. Chapter 31. Literally, it's that quick with these chapters at the end. Yeah. Sandy stands in the boat trying to knock Holly out, but gets knocked the fuck out instead. Holly panics and eventually gets thrown out of the boat. She tries swimming to the shore, and once she makes it out of the current, she notices a drowned tree in the middle of the river that she's about to slam into. Chapter 32. She takes a deep breath and gets real high and dunks into the water, avoiding the tree. And, so, and, and thinks, hey, what's going on? Yes. Uh, I'm glad you got that one. Uh, she makes it under the, she makes it under and finally makes it to the shore. She decides to take the river back to the campsite. She thinks of the woods near Fear Street that are supposedly haunted and wonders if Sandy, who she believes is dead, will haunt these woods. That was the second reference to, uh, to Fear Street. There we go. There we go. Then she hears footsteps in front of her and she freezes. It's just a doe and her offspring getting water. She continues on her way and then hears more footsteps, but... But for behind... It's a deer on two legs. <laughs> she does hope it's a deer, but to her dismay, it's Sandy. And he's fucking pissed. Sandy tells her how he survived and then comes at her with a tree branch. Holly runs into the woods and eventually makes it to a hill that she cl tries to climb, but the rocks are too slippery from the morning dew. Sandy hits her left leg with the branch and trips her. As she tries getting her bearings, she sees a small cave, and she rushes to it, but the entrance of the cave is a nest of hissing snakes. <gasps> be funny if they were just uh, more garter snakes. Right. <laughs> That's me. Just... <laughs> and then you just pick it up and just kind of move it away. Yep. Holly freezes up and realizes that the cave may be too small for her. Then Sandy grabs her leg, and she decides, fuck it. She grabs it near a snake and yeets the fucker at Sandy's face. <laughs> <laughs> he freaks out and tumbles down the hill and lands in a heap. She goes down to check if he's alive. And besides being all twisted up and mangled, he's still breathing. She decides to head back for help when another body comes from the trees. It's Mick! And she freaks out. He calms her down and, and there's a page break. What and, I love is at first she like tells him to fuck off, basically. Yeah, she freaks out, yeah. An ambulance comes and takes Sandy away. Mick explains that he felt guilty about how he treated Holly and wanted to try and say sorry before everyone woke up, but he didn't get the chance when Sandy w and her left. He then explains that he followed the two of them, but she, but since she, he's not a good canoeer, he fell behind, and that's why he came came at the end of that kind of confrontation. Another page break, and you know what? I think we'll end this by reading the 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 last part of the chapter. Sam, you want to take the take the sure? Take it. I couldn't sleep last night. He said I. I had a lot of thinking to do. I felt really bad about what happened the other day, about the way we've all been treating you. I tried, to da I tried all day to find the words, but I just couldn't. I wanted to tell you I'm really sorry. I mean, I was kind of mad at you for what happened earlier, but that's no excuse. This may sound r weird, but I really do like you a lot. Holly, Holly felt sympathetic to Mick. <laughs> she could see how hard it was for him to admit he'd been wrong. But why did you follow me and Sandy? She said, puzzled. Well, as I said, I decided I wanted to apologize to you. And I thought, well, I talked to you in the early morning before the others woke up, but then I saw Sandy come and talk to you. When the two of you went off in the canoe, I decided to follow just to see what you were I don't know why to. I said to read this page. It's literally just yeah, saying what I Yeah, that's why I'm did. like... Uh, later. Let's skip ahead. So, I'm glad you did. Thanks, Mick. Basically is what she says. Yeah. And when the camp bus arrived, Uncle Bill ran to Holly and took her in a took her in his arms. He seemed to have an age ten years past the past in the past day. How are you feeling, Princess? he asked Holly. I'm all right now, she said. What will happen to Sandy? He'll get the help he needs, Uncle <laughs> Bill said sadly. Shock therapy. I, ju I just didn't know. How can you imagine he actually killed Deborah? Strangled her. I had no idea. Seth, the boy who died last year, was a stepbrother. They had different last names. How could I have known they were related? It wasn't your fault, Holly said. None of it was. Uh, 
The police found a stack of letters in Sandy's room, Uncle Bill went on. They were all addressed to Chief. Turns out that was Seth's private nickname. What about the feathers? Did they find any red feathers in Sandy's things? Oh, yeah. There's a whole stash of in a, in a box under his bunk. He murdered a fucking cardinal. <laughs> you were right about that, after all. So it's over. Yes. Maybe now Camp Nightwing can back to being a happy place again. Holly hugged him and started back to the cabin to change. Hey, wait up, someone called. She turned on the path to see Mick hurrying after her. How are you doing, he asked, his face filled with concern. You okay? Yeah, I am, she smiled at him. Thanks to you. Aw, shucks, he said with an exaggerated mind. Did he say aw, shucks? Yeah. Okay. He started to say something else, but a bright green snake dropped out of the tree into the path of their feet. Hey! He leapt backward to avoid stepping on it. Holly bent down, nonchalantly picked up the snake, and tossed it into the woods. It's just a snake, she said, smiling at him playfully. Wow. His mouth opened in surprise. I'm impressed. You changed, Holly. I think you're catching on to this place. Yes, I think I am, Holly agreed. And I think from now I'm gonna like it here. Me too, Mick said quietly, and put his arm around her. And they wandered happily into the path up to their cabins. The end. <sighs> hey, he said sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry I tried to fucking molest you. Multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. You saved me, so that that, that equals it out, right? Technically, you didn't do anything. I saw you limping he, in the he, woods. He just fucking domino masked her. Or whatever it is. A tuxedo yeah. masked her. You didn't do anything. My job here is done. Yeah. Because he yeah. just came out of the woods at the end after she defended herself. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah. <laughs> he, but it's just that idea of like, oh, thanks to you, I'm okay. Yeah. But uh, what do you think of this book, Sam? Up till the ending, I thought it was pretty good. I really enjoyed it as well. This actually might be one of my favorite Fear Street books now. I've only read maybe like a, a handful of them, but it does kind of suffer from the same like problems with like a lot of R.L. Stein, like Fear Street and other young adult books where they're they're very formulaic. Like there's there's no doubt about it. It's there's always a twist ending after almost after every fucking chapter. But at least this one was just entertaining. I thought Holly was a, Holly was a really n- good protagonist. Yeah. I was about to say, she was just a cute, innocent girl. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed this one. Like, what yeah. were some favorite parts you had? One of my one of my favorite parts was kind of like her interact, like kind of the little stuff of just the, like, built, interacting with the campers and kind of doing her job. Because mm-hmm. it just kind of makes it feel, like, it, it's obviously a lot of teenage drama and mm-hmm. bullshit. Yeah. But well, I mean, also, that's, I mean, it's a young adult book, so. Yeah, so that's. But I'm saying, like, it's also just kind of nice seeing, like, the, oh, her interacting with the other kids. Yeah. I, I felt that it also felt pretty realistic with, like, the whole sexual dynamics. Yeah. <laughs> sexual dynamics. But kind of, like, the sexual tension, if anything, between a lot of them. Like, it feels very true and real to a a summer camp kind of feel. Yeah. So, I, I, I would, if I had to score this one out of five, uh, you know, five being a phenomenal book, I would reread again. One being absolute garbage. D- belongs in the trash. I think I'd give this one a three out of five. Like it's a, it's slightly above average. Not enough to get like, but not enough to get a four or a three and a half. But like, I I think it's above average. Where it's 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 just like a little. It's like it's a C plus. Yeah. You know, it's it's a fun read, but it's very formulaic. It's very R L Steiny. So if you do like that kind of formula to it, I I would say read it for sure. Uh, and it gives me a little bit of excitement to see how much they take from this book for the, the second Fear Street movie. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see soon enough, right? That's about to say. The yeah. first movie comes out at, at the end of the week after we record this at the end of the week. So pretty excited to see the first one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll do, we'll be doing But I Digresses for each movie. Yes. Like for sure. Like that's, that's the plan for the But I Digresses is every week we're doing one for each one. <laughs> and the... Uh... I'm going to say, one of the things that... I'm going to say, do you mind if I get, like, nitpicks and stuff? Go right ahead! So, one of the things that I thought would make a stronger ending Mm -hmm. was instead of it being Mick... Yeah. ...was if it would either be, like, the group of the kids kind of being like, yeah, we realize we were dicks Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Or even Jerry kind of being like... I hate to say it, this feels more realistic, though. Yeah. Like, doing that, doing the, oh, man, you almost died, we're sorry. That, like, yeah, it feels kind of realistic, but at the same time, it feels a little forced, if you ask me. I feel like one person being like, I'm sorry, I was a dick, yeah. makes more sense than a group of teenagers. Well, part of me, again, almost kind of wanted it to be Jerry and being like, I've been kind of a whole cunt this summer, haven't I? Yeah. Sorry. Mm. And not them necessarily being friends and again. Yeah. Because that's not realistic. Like, I'm not saying. Yeah. But at least, like, them no longer, like, going at each like, More frenemy than anything. Yeah. 
Or at least just kind of like, no, we don't talk. Yeah. Just just a, a Cold War agreeance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, nah, I don't think it would have worked for this book. I just don't like Mick. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't like any, I don't really like anyone either, really, except for yeah. Holly. I like Sandy a lot. Like, did you see yeah. that one coming from a mile away as well? So it's one of those, like, for a sec, it had me going with John, but then it was like, I have to go write letters, and I'm like, oh, it's not gonna be John, that's too... It's too obvious. Yeah. So I'm like, it's probably Sandy, because he's being way too nice, like... Like, I knew from the start it was Sandy, it was just too damn obvious for me. Maybe it's because I know Arl Stein books, like, a lo- I'm gonna tell you up front, spoiler for all Fear Street books, it's usually the really nice guy is, turns out to be the murderer. Arl Stein knows what's up whenever they say they're a nice guy, it's not true. Right? <laughs> Arl Stein, the true Chad. <laughs> Uh, now I gotta put. Now I gotta make that as an image. So you wanna do like a virgin? What would be the virgin version? Virgin, uh, uh, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say K.A. Applegate, but no, K.A. Applegate's a fucking she, Chad. I was gonna say I would put more like Virgin J.K. Rowling, Chad Applegate for that comparison. Ooh, wait, you know what? Virgin Christopher Pike. That's that's another young adult horror novelist oh, from okay. the '90s and '80s. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Even though I like Christopher Pike a little bit more than Arl Stein, not a huge like. If, if I had to choose between one or the other, I probably would choose a, a Pike book over a Stein book. But, but the meme makes it better. The meme does make it better. I, I do like Arl Stein books a lot. It's just, they're very formulaic. Yeah. And what would you give this out of five? I'd give it a three out of five. Also, I enjoyed yeah. it. It's not bad by any means, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily, it's not above its criticisms. Now, do you, okay, I, I kind of, kind of like with Rubles Rupees, we usually have like, Stuff that, like, uh, we would recommend with this. Do you have any summer camp books, movies, or anything that you would recommend with this book? I can't really think of, like, horror-adjacent stuff, because I'm not horror. Yeah. I can think of a summer camp one that I really love. Oh, yeah? Psychonauts. Okay. Yeah. It's not horror, but... There, there's, it's horror-adjacent, almost. Yeah. It's got it's some creepy, creepy elements. It's creepy elements, but... I don't think you'd really go with this. But just the summer camp vibe of... Mm, just because it's a summer camp doesn't mean... That's like me saying, yeah, go go watch Heavyweights after this one. I watch heavyweights again. Well, I know how much you love heavyweights. I love heavyweights, but I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna recommend it on this one. No, I would recommend Friday the Thirteenth Part Two uh, because this this book definitely takes the most inspiration from that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'd, I'd say watch any horror camp movie. Like you can watch Sleep The Away Burning, camp. Sleepaway Camp. God, why are the other ones skipping my mind? Is it, wait, is it The Burning? Oh, God, I can't remember if that's the right title or not. That's the one with uh, I was gonna say Banksy. <laughs> <laughs> not a uh, cropsy i think it's the burning ah oh, god it's been too long since i've watched it it's on eight it's on uh, april fools it's on amazon prime so i might watch that sometime amazon amazon so you said it just amazon it's amazon but yeah those i i I'd, I'd, you know personally i'd recommend at least friday the 13th you know because it's always a good time to watch any of those i also recommend at least the first sleepaway camp though it is not the most well-aged movie Though I know a lot of trans horror fans love this movie still, but they will admit that it is problematic. Yeah, it's one of those, like, I can't really speak too much of it as I am not trans, so I'm not gonna. But it's one of those, I think if you understand at least its problematic elements, Mm -hmm. you can kind of go in with it. And and the the actress who performed in it, she, like, fully admits it, but she's like, you know what, this has helped a lot of people out, and it's done more good than it's done bad. Yeah. So... And and she she she's been a very if I'm if I'm remembering correctly she's a very strong supporter of trans community. Please correct us if we're wrong. Yeah, we do like. I mean, I'll, I'll probably look it up, but I'm pretty positive she's really cool. Yeah, like um. I mean, most people from the horror movie communities tend to be really cool. Yeah. Except for Harvey Weinstein, one of his first movies was The Burning. <laughs> so um, don't watch that one. Well, it's not he's not getting that money, so fuck him. So watch it or not, whatever. Hey, uh, fucking pirate it! I don't care. Yeah. I'm cool with that. And so you don't have to see it on Amazon Prime. Right. Fuck Bezos. Yeah. Um, Fuck him. So, uh, I, I guess that's the end of the episode, right? Yeah. Do you have anything else to say? Oh, wait, no, I forgot. There's one, I forgot to put my, say my one connection between this and Goosebumps. Another connection. Hmm. Dairy Freeze. Oh, yeah. Is mentioned in this book. Uh, Holly said she was originally going to work at Dairy Freeze, but that fell through. Dairy Freeze is a location in Say Cheese and Die um the oh god i think it's jerry I, i'm probably way off i can't remember the main characters well there's like a like yeah i guess the main character's name i think it's jerry from say cheese and die his brother works at dairy freeze as well so that's i think that's a pretty nice little connection right there because dairy freeze is not a real place as yeah. far as i know unless it's like a small town thing like columbus Ohio or some See, shit i just think it's probably just a dairy queen we yeah. can't say dairy queen kind of thing yeah 
So they made Tasty Freeze and Dairy Queen. They just mixed yeah. those two together. Because yeah. Tasty Freeze is, is, a, is a separate brand. Yep, I know. So they just they just mixed Dairy Freeze. That's yeah. all it was, yeah. They had so. a baby. Mm. So they have terrible peanuts allergies. They have pumpkin spice dip stuff in the fall. <laughs> I'd try it. Uh, no thanks. All right, that's the end of the episode. You can follow the podcast at Speaking of Which Podcast on Facebook, SLW underscore podcast on Twitter, and you can follow me at the underscore group on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google, Amazon, Spotify, pretty much everywhere you can listen to a podcast, you can find us there. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, hey, rate and review us. It means a lot. And if you want to hear us talk about more Fear Street books, hey, Dollar on the Patreon, tell us which one, and I'll gladly, we'll gladly read that one. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, follow me at the underscore group on Twitter and Instagram, and we also have our YouTube page, which currently taking us a little break from gaming just for a little bit till we can kind of catch up with stuff. I'm still getting used to my work schedule. Um, I, I did record something, but I can't edit it because, unfortunately, we don't have fucking internet at the time because... I don't know how, but the cord got cut. I think it was just the edge. I'm gonna. Sh- I I have a theory, cause it it fell, and I think the it the the thing just literally slammed onto it and like cut it somehow. That, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. Oh, I thought you were referring to the edge, as in the YouTube guitarist. <laughs> no, yeah, the edge just snuck into our house. Yeah, he, he in Arizona. That. Yeah, and cut our cable. Yeah, and then walked out and did nothing else. Yeah, exactly. Where can we find you, Sam? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Berserker Rose. All right, Sam. Since I didn't say it once, we're not going to go out with Gorilla Radio because lights out, Gorilla Radio. Turn that shit up. Uh, no, we're not going to go with that. I think we should go with a Jason song, uh, yeah. a band I really like, who also uh, do our <laughs> do our that they, they, they did it for me. No, I just I took one of their songs as our our, our theme song for regular speaking of which. Because, as they say on the back of the album, we don't give a shit what you do with our music. So. So. I I was like, okay, I'll only take less than 15 seconds of this and put it as our theme song. And that's our theme song. So I, I think I'm going to try to find one. Maybe Camp Arawak. I might do that one or something else. Okay. So I'll find something. Maybe Imposter, because, you know, he's an imposter. A rotten little bastard. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Lights out. Turn on the radio. I'm gonna kill that girl I'm gonna kill that girl I'm gonna kill that girl tonight I'm gonna kill that girl